Japan entered its lost decade in the early 90s. And many of the other global central banks, because of course every country has their own central bank, and all of those central banks, or at least many of them, would write papers about how what they were doing didn't work. But somewhere along the way, between the early 90s and after 2008, the Bank of Japan became a trendsetter. Now, a lot of people always ask me, can't they just keep this insanity going forever? Well, we're going to take a look at the Bank of Japan and the insanity. And then at the end of this, maybe you can draw your own conclusions on whether or not they can keep this insanity going forever. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service gold and silver dealer specializes is specializing in custom strategies for the individuals to help you through, and then, dare I say it, even thrive through this coming crisis. Now, uh, last week we started a new thing, so I'm just going to give you a little reminder that as we're going through it, my goal, our goal here at ITM, is that you understand this information so that you can utilize it in order to make educated choices. So if you have a question about any of the different slides on this particular topic, just type it in and I'll be answering all the questions at the end of this presentation. If it has to do with anything else, then please send it to questions at itmtrading.com. Yep. .com. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about Japan and Japan's central bank because they really have set the stage for maybe the next new global, central bank global monetary tool. And we need to know about this, but frankly, it's also leading into modern money, money theory or MMT. And much as everybody wants to say, oh, we're not doing it. The reality is, is that all of the central banks are doing different forms of it already in all of the quantitative easing, the money for free, uh, choosing winners and losers and, and funding government deficits, spending deficits. So Japan is actually not unique in this. They're just further ahead than we are. Because back in the late 90s is when they went to a zero interest rate policy or ZERP which most of the rest of the world adopted, <coughs> excuse me, in 2008. In the early 2000s, because the zero interest rate policy didn't work, they added quantitative easing or QE. Now the QE is money printing for free because, hey, they're giving you money at 0% interest. You can take on all the debt that you want with that. But that didn't work either to boost their inflation. Understand, that's what the goal is, is to generate inflation. So they did another big round of it when the crisis, global crisis hit in 2007, 2008. But that was so ineffective that then they added QQE, which is really, it stands for qualitative and quantitative easing. But what that really means, it's money printing on steroids. That's what that means. And because that didn't work so well, they, interest, they introduced NERP, which is negative interest rate policy. So zero wasn't enough. We're going to go below zero. But even that didn't work. So they added YCC, which stands for Yield Curve Control. So welcome to the land of central bank experimentations. 
The rest of the world has not yet gone to the QE on steroids. That's the next step. Nor have they gone to a full yield curve control. But what happened in Japan when they went to yield curve control? Guess what? Mm -hmm. Inverted. An, an inverted yield curve. And we're going to be talking a lot more about it. Wait until you see this report that I found that was authorized and paid for by the New York Federal Reserve about the central Japan central bank policies, all these policies that we're looking at. Because frankly, the only difference between modern money theory and what they're already doing is that modern money theory says that you don't really need to tax the public, that the central bank, since you're going to pay that debt with the currency that you create, that the central bank can just fund all of these government programs. Hey, they've been saying no inflation. And I'm going to put this out there. If any of you are watching that live in Japan or have lived in Japan since the 90s, can you please let us know if your cost of living has stayed the same? Because with all of this QE and all of this NERP and ZERP and this and that and all of this, they're still only sitting at their expected maybe a 1.3% inflation rate this year. Now, personally, I don't think inflation is good. And we have to have a whole other discussion on it. But that's their stated goal. And they've not been able to do it. And what we have coming up on October 1st, potentially, because they've postponed it twice already, they might not postpone it again is a new experiment where they're going to be raising the sales tax. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And the big question really is, is can their population absorb another tax? Because we may well be in Japan at the level of peak tax. I don't know that yet. Time is going to tell us that. But this is the big debate that's going on because clearly they have to keep funding these programs. How are they going to do it? Where is that money going to come from? That's the question. Just to kind of let you see this, once they decided to go to NERP, the negative interest rate policy, boy, they did it in a huge way. And you can see that here, but you can also see that coming up again. So much as they're trying to support all of these things and they don't really want an inverted yield curve, that's not good. That foretells a recession, but this next piece is going to be way bigger than a little old recession. This is going to lead to a massive financial crisis. What tools do the central banks have left? You saw all the things that the Bank of Japan tried. What tools do they have left to cover up the problems, because they certainly never fix them. They just change how they account for them. And that's really all. So let's just take a deeper dive into that, because we know that the entire markets in Japan, whether it's the um, stock markets through the ETFs, I mean, the Bank of Japan owns uh, like 80 or 90 percent of all of the ETFs, so it's supporting the stock markets. Or if it's doing um, the real estate market through REITs or the government bond market through, um, through buying government bonds, Japanese government bonds. So much as we want to think that's extraordinary, but wait a minute. Here in the U.S., the Federal Reserve has been doing the same thing. Their balance sheet is just not as big. But all of them, when they try to pull back a little bit on the balance sheet, well, you saw what happened in December and the, the very beginning of January. And then you also saw on January 4th when that course was reversed. The global central bankers went, no, no, we're not going to tighten anymore. We're going to stop that because the markets couldn't deal with it because that's what's really supporting the markets. That and corporations and all the tax benefits that they've been going through. So this is the Bank of Japan's balance sheet and you can see how high that is. And with all of the, the QE, QQE, NERP, 
Zerp, QQE on steroids and everything, still they cannot withdraw support. They want you to think that everything is going so well. Well, that makes no sense at all. Because if, if the economies, if the global economies were actually stimulated by this, they wouldn't need to continue to do more and more and more extraordinary measures. And really, what all of these extraordinary measures have, have done, and Meg, I want you to uh, make sure you put the link to the one that I did uh, recently on the zombie firms. Because with interest rates at zero, firms that should, go, should have gone bankrupt are able to continue to fund at least their minimum operations. And that really, you know, in a true capitalist economy, if you can't afford yourself, you will go bankrupt. And that's what gets rid of the garbage and allows the rest of the, of the real growth in the economy to occur. But all of this financial engineering which is modifying how using perception management, so how we think about the markets and what we're seeing to move forward in a manner that supports the central banks and the government's goal. That's huge how we perceive this and how much credibility and confidence we have in what we think of as these traditional um, authoritarian institutions like the central banks. But until 1913, they all had a shelf life of between 15 and 20 years typically because governments knew central banks would create the hyperinflation. And, and it wasn't that they would be doing it, the governments would encourage them to be doing it. So when a central bank had a limited life, well, then it could only get so bad. In 1913, and then actually in 1927, was the first time historically that the U.S. gave a central bank a perpetual charter. That was the Federal Reserve. So that's why they've been able to uh, control or slow that pace of inflation down and keep this game going so long. But it's really just a confidence game. And that's what scares them with the populism and with the rise of nationalism is that that confidence that the public has in their abilities is waning. And particularly in the Bank of Japan, their ability to create that. I mean, I shake my head because it just is so counterintelligent to me. But the, but the population's ability um, or loss of confidence that the Japanese central bank can create 2% inflation. Why, does, why do they want us to think that they're generating more inflation? Because if you're thinking about buying something and you think it's going to cost you more down the road, then you bring that spending forward and perhaps take on debt to make that purchase. That's why that perception of inflation is so important. And in Japan, population doesn't trust it so much. So we've got to generate more of this fiat money to make all of these markets look, that nominal confusion piece, look like they're appreciating even as they're destroying the value of the fiat currency. Because I really want you to ask yourself, if something is free and abundant, you can get all that you want and doesn't cost you anything. Truthfully, how much value does that have? I can tell you from personal experience that if I spend my time cultivating my strawberries, I know what went into this beautiful ripe strawberry. And Megan will laugh, but I will savor that. I will take itty bitty bites and enjoy every single teeny bite in the flavor of that strawberry. If I go to the grocery store and I spend two fifty or three dollars on a pint of organic strawberries, well that was pretty easy for me to do. I, it doesn't have as much value to me 
as that one strawberry that I put forth massive effort for. And I want you to look at yourselves and, and see if that doesn't resonate with you. Because that's really what's been happening. This money has no value. And all of this money for free at zero interest rates. So we have global inverted or flattened yield curves. And we're going to talk about why that matters right now. This is a gem of a report. This was authorized and paid for by the Federal Bank of New York, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, so our Federal Reserve, to examine the Bank of Japan's um, yield curve control regime. But what you see and what I've got underlined here, this is really the central bank control regime. And this is just a higher level of control on where those interest rates are because the theory is that if you can borrow money cheaply, you're going to borrow and spend. And then, of course, that is economically stimulative and in theory increases uh, inflation. And, and actually, in reality, too. Even though they keep telling us we have no inflation here, mm, our cost of living has grown quite a bit since the crisis in 2008. Think back about how much it cost for tuition or, I mean, gas went up a lot during that period of time. It's near those levels again, or your food or your medical or any of the things that you need on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to welcome you to this regime in which we've been functioning where central banks have taken more and more and more and more control. And, you know, really, what could go wrong? So in 2011, the Bank of Japan only owned less than 10% of the JGBs, so the sovereign debt of the Japanese government. That was 2011. But nothing that they were doing since the 90s were working. So here we go. Here's the timeline, folks. 98, they installed zero interest rate policy, ZERP. That didn't work. 2001, they introduced QE. So interest rates are at zero, and now they are printing, 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 printing to try to stimulate, but that didn't work either. So they put them on steroids, QE on steroids in 2013. In 2015, they did that plus that yield curve control regime, which we're going to take a look deeper dive look at. And in 2016, you got the whole ball of wax and nothing is working except that the Bank of Japan now owns 47% of the sovereign debt, the government debt of Japan. 47% in just a few years, seven years from below 10%, it, 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 it's more than quadrupled. Do you get this? <laughs> this is like, I, I'm in the twilight zone. Totally read this report. Totally, totally, totally read this report. I'm telling you right now. You know, I, I stumbled across it last night. So I may sound a little uh, tired because I couldn't put this together without going through this whole thing. And it is worth a read, the whole thing. Because what the Bank of New, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York really wanted to see was, okay, what are the results of all of these extraordinary measures that really have become typical now? Well, number one, from their report, really want you to get this piece, from their report, profitability at the banks and financial institutions <gasps> deteriorated. And that generates stability concerns. Well, yeah, you've had interest rates at zero for a very, very long time. I mean, really, since 98. So how do banks make money? As normal intermediaries, which is really what their original function was, 
they would take in deposits and they would take those deposits, your savings, and loan, and they'd pay you interest on it, so they'd borrow that from you, and then they would loan that out at a higher rate, and the difference between what they had to pay you and what they loaned it out for was their profit. So when you have a flat yield curve and you have zero interest rates, mm, there's no room for that. And so what banks have been forced to do, what everybody's been forced to do, is go out and take more risk. And that raises stability concerns because in this next crisis, who's going to be there to push money into the system? The central banks can put as much into the banking system as they want, but if nobody's borrowing it, it really doesn't do any good. And really all of this QE has gone into the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market to make them reflated reflated, not revalued, but reflated. That's why they're overvalued. Number two, number two is that it has increased the risk exposure in financial institutions, portfolio rebalancing, because talking about that need for income well, what have a lot of corporations done and, and banks and financial institutions done is they have gone out again, they've bought more stock, more risky even, and we're going to talk a minute about pensions and insurance, but they've even gone to riskier assets to attempt to, to generate more income, including derivatives, derivatives, which are just big bets that have really, frankly, a limited market if they're OTC. But because they've been forced to do this, well, that puts a lot of pressure, well, for example, on the Bank of Japan. Why in the world do you think that they bought as many stocks, as many bonds, and as much real estate? Because their financial institutions are going overseas. But what that also does, especially for, say, pensions and insurance companies, you now have uh, a currency mismatch because when they pay out those benefits, they have to do it in yen. But their investments could be in the terms of dollars or, or renminbi or euros or some other currency. And depending upon where uh, the strength of the yen against those other currencies if they're forced to sell an asset, they could take some substantial losses. See the problem? That's the problem. That's why rebalancing the portfolio to attempt to generate income because of this interest rate, essentially non-existent interest rate environment, that's why it increases the risk. Number three, weakened functioning of financial intermediaries at the reversal rate. So what they're talking about is that um, rate of inversion and that loss of ability to generate income on their investments, okay? So in other words, when you make a deposit into a bank and they pay you a certain amount of money for that, well, in this environment, you're not getting paid anything. So number one, it doesn't necessarily encourage you to be a, prudent saver. So that takes some of the um, cushion out of the banking system, though I will tell you that deposits, and you'll see that in this report, and I don't have it in front of me, so I could be off a little bit, but if I remember the data correctly, and I, I think I do, 79% of uh, deposits in Japan fund the bank's activity, but they're not making any money on that. So when this next crisis occurs, I mean, how far below zero can you go? That may be tested. I know that's going to be tested, but that's the question. Nobody really knows. And then finally, in number four, this is the results. It is a, and these are all quotes, by the way. This is the, directly from the report. Negative impact on market sentiment through life insurances and pensions. Mark my words on this, pull up your contracts if you own any insurance products 
or any mutual funds or pension products. And what you will find when you look at that contract in big bold letters, and it'll be throughout the whole piece, is that it is based upon the claims paying ability of that institution. So what happens if they can't pay that? What if they can't pay your benefits? Now, when I was a stockbroker and an insurance company went out, they did not want anybody to realize that an insurance company died. So another insurance company would come in and pick up all of those policies and life would continue on to keep you in the dark. But this is huge. This is huge. When Japan collapses, and, you know, keep in mind who's really coming up. They have the largest aging population, and they have the largest debt loads. Because none of this ZERP, NERP, whatever it is, none of it has worked. None of it has worked. They're even saying none of it has worked. What it's really done, it's made the financial system a whole lot more vulnerable. And this matters to you because we are all incestuously intertwined. And the global central banks, every country has a central bank, they're all watching. What can they get away with? What can't they get away with? They tested here, they tested there. I mean, the U.S. was really the one to, well, actually QE happened in 2001 in Japan. So it wasn't actually the, the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve introduced it in the current crisis, but it's been used before. And all of this garbage, this financial engineering has just made the system weaker and therefore more vulnerable to shocks. Now I know this graph is little teeny, but what it is is it's showing Japan's inflation, what they track, the core inflation. And they haven't been able to hit that 2% target, period. So their stated goal and why they were doing all of this, they haven't hit it and they've made their system more vulnerable. I mean, seriously. But here's their conclusion. This killed me. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, you've got to read this report. I mean, if I wasn't so tired when I was reading it, I, I, I just kept going, oh my God. So their conclusion is that the design and the communication and the implementation of yield curve control has proved successful. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. I shouldn't have covered up that hole. I should have made that so I could actually read that. But in the report, they're showing why it was not successful. And yet, with all of this data and all of this garbage, read the report for yourself, the link's below. They're saying that it's a success. And who authorized that? The Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And they agree. This has been an unmitigated success. Cognizant dissonance, people. It's not true. And when something seems insane, believe it. It is. And insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. We've had this crap going on in Japan since 1998. By their own admission, all it has done is created more vulnerabilities in the system. That's all it has done. What could possibly go wrong? Hmm. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Even though they postponed it twice, guess what happens on October 1st? Now, they could postpone it again, so this isn't quite a guarantee but they're going to put in a consumption tax, raise that consumption tax from what is currently 8% up to 12% because they're trying to generate some more income 
to pay for all of this garbage so they can keep buying and propping up the stock market and the bond market and the real estate market and everything in the world. Now here's really the question. The Japanese public is stretched really thin. The households are stretched really thin. They expect that this is going to cost the households 5.6 trillion yen. And because when they did it in 2014, which is why they postponed this additional sales tax twice, they know that consumption collapsed. It just collapsed. So they're expecting that to happen again. And really, if anybody's got a comment about this one, can you please tell me how costing households 5.6 trillion yen and then giving them back 2 trillion in different forms of stimulus, like, oh, maybe they won't raise the rates on food or, oh, some child care or, oh, we'll give you an extra bonus if you buy a car or you buy a house or something like that. I'm sorry, Th this is just craziness to me. But that's what's going to happen in just a couple of months. For a country that has the largest public debt and the fastest aging population. And that could be the tipping point that would send their next test into pure MMT. Because frankly, the only difference between modern money theory and what they're already doing is that tax piece. And nobody really knows whether or not the Japanese households can absorb an additional 5.6 trillion yen in tax. We're going to find that out. But since the Federal Reserve and likely lots of other central banks think that these policies have been so successful. We're about to see this on a massive scale. Now, you know what really all of that means? What all of that really means is that at some point in here, maybe sooner, maybe a little bit more time, but I don't think a whole lot more time. They're going to tax the public, the households, to death. We're going to hit peak tax, and the whole world is going to be printing money just because they can. How come Japan has been able to get away with it for all this time? People ask me that all the time. And the answer is really simple. Because the whole world agreed to let them get away with it. To continue to buy some of their debt to continue to buy their exports, to continue to sell them imports, the whole world agreed. But that was then. Now we have the rise of populism and nationalism. And we also have a decline in confidence in what is thought of as traditional institutions, so governments and central banks. If those insurance companies and those pensions don't pay out? Well, then everybody's going to know what a fraud that was. And when people try and run, they're not going to be able to. But MMT, I can't guarantee this. But I'm 130 bazillion percent certain. There's your hyperinflation, people. And we could see it begin in earnest and, and with authority and all of that before the end of this year. Because October 1st, if they don't change that, we might just see peak tax. The point at which taxing the public is counterproductive. Just like we had peak debt in 97. Doesn't mean you can't tax more. Didn't mean you couldn't grow more debt. But what it does mean is that doing that is counterproductive and undermines 
what you're really trying to accomplish, presuming you're trying to really get stimulation and growth. So, what's the answer? Well, let's take a look at the gold demand trends for the first quarter of 2019, and we're going to look more at that tomorrow too. And specifically, we're going to look at central banks. And I quote, the factors that drove central bank net purchases to a 50-year high in 2018 remained relevant at the start of 2019. Yeah, you betcha they did. So that this first quarter was the strongest quarter since 2013. What was happening in 2013? Global central banks were kicking out off all sorts of QE and stimulus and NERP and ZERP and all of these programs because the system was falling apart and the central banks were losing control. And that's when they were buying, for the first quarter anyway, this level of gold. Between 2016 and 2018, you can see the purchases, while positive, unlike prior to 2008, which were negative, they were just selling, 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 but they had declined. Not anymore. Look at this. Tremendous amount. In fact, on a rolling quarterly average, it's at the highest level ever since they tracked it. And for 2018, that was the highest level in 50 years of gold purchases. For 2018, so this one and these, the highest level of central bank gold purchases in 50 years, the second highest level ever next to Bretton Woods. Looks like we've just surpassed that at least in a rolling four quarters. We have surpassed that. Highest level of central bank gold buying ever, 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 ever. Do you get this? Do you think these central banks know about these experiments? I'm thinking they do. I'm thinking they do. And I'm thinking that they have an understanding of the risks. And what they're counting on is that you don't. And people don't. That's why it's so critical for you to share this information. They don't want to read this? Send them the report. You've got the links on all my research. Send them some of that, maybe. Anything. But you've got to share this information. Because if you do not, and I know nobody wants to hear it, but hey, ignorance doesn't make you immune. It simply leaves you vulnerable. Central banks are getting into a position so that they can maintain their power through purchasing power when the poopy hits the fan and they know they're out of tools and they have no idea what they're going to do next. They know that some form, well, they've been using lots of forms of modern money theory, that the next point, point is just printing. Just printing and funding everything. There's your hyperinflation, people. And at some point after that, there's the reset. And that is what the gold is for. And that is why more and more and more central banks are accumulating faster and faster and faster. You need to be doing, well, you do whatever you are comfortable doing. I can't tell you what to do. But for me personally, I'm doing what the central bankers are doing for themselves. It's an easy way to track what you should be doing. If they're buying gold, you should be buying gold. If JP Morgan is buying silver, you should be buying silver. Are they buying physical or are they buying paper? Paper is about manipulation. Paper doesn't mean anything. It has no value when it's cheap and easy to create. Gold takes effort to pull out of the ground. Silver is a byproduct, but it still takes effort to purify it, to mine it, to mint it. It takes labor and energy and work and effort. 
and it's used everywhere across the entire globe. In fact, I went on vacation and I went to some um, like uh, Michelin star restaurants, two different Michelin star restaurants. I actually ate gold for dinner. I have a picture somewhere. So it's even used in food. It was really tasty too. But I hope you can see what I'm trying to show you. This would be one I cannot encourage you enough to read that report from uh, that was authorized by the bank of the uh, New York Fed. I mean, seriously. And so now I'm going to take some questions. Okay, on slide number four. Tim Abuish asks, but will paper, gold, silver disappear when banks fail? Oh, f fall to push the gold, silver price up or will paper, gold, silver always be existing so the silver and gold price always be kept low? Okay, the... A rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. And so since the central banks want you to remain in this right now, then it benefits them, while, especially while they're accumulating, then it benefits them to keep that price low. However, this is how a reset will be done. You know, like Harry Dent said, well, they could push gold down to $400 an ounce. He's talking about paper gold because it, it costs a buck ten for a central bank to control 500 ounces of physical gold and a buck fifty for JP Morgan to control 500 ounces of physical gold. Cheap. It has no value. So, yeah, you can do anything you want with the paper gold. But in the physical realm, there are limitations. There will not be any gold miners. I can't say that definitively, but it's just completely illogical. Why would a physical gold miner sell gold below his cost? He wouldn't. Plus, paper gold has use in one place, the financial system. Whereas physical gold, physical silver is in electronics. It's in food, like I just showed you. It's in the monetary system. Um, it, it's everywhere. It's in every jewelry. It's in every single aspect of the economy. So that demand will create a price differential between the paper gold and the physical gold. I experienced that in 2008. I even have um, charts and data where you can see that yourself. But uh, the paper gold, what's going to happen is the whole system's going to default and then it's all going to reset. And I would imagine the same thing will happen with the spot gold, that paper gold as well. But uh, there comes a point where central banks need you to know the true value or at least near the true value of gold because that's how they then um, completely reset their currencies. Now their currencies do go to, zil to zero value and they can pay off their debts with currencies that have zero value. And because people think of it as legal tender, they will be accepted that way. And that's how they'll do the reset of the debt most likely. And uh, let's see, Rod asks, uh, back on slide four again, uh, but Ron uh, asks, is MMT a viable monetary policy or just something dug up and promoted to justify QE to infinity? Yep, the second part. It's not viable. It's not viable at all because when you can fund all of these programs and you just start spending and spending and spending, I mean, all right, think of it kind of, think of it this way. Um, let's say that you go out and you have a job and you have an income from your job and you have to save up from that income from for anything that you want. So you can't just go out and buy a house or buy a car. You have to save up that money first. And you do. You take time and effort and years and years and years to save up enough money to go and buy your first car. How much meaning does that car have for you because of the level of effort you had to put out for it? 
How much value does it have? How likely are you to take good care of it? Other than you turn 16 and your parents get you a Mercedes and they pay for everything. Okay, well, I happen to know from personal experience, I won't name names, that these young kids that have gone out and wrecked their car, like, boom, within a week or even less of when they got it. Because the car really didn't have a whole lot of meaning. It was great. They could now travel around and do all of that. But it wasn't their labor or their effort that it took to get that car. So anything that is worth having is worth working for. And money for free in MMT will lose all value. I, I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee that because you could see what's happened. Um, well... You know, since the Federal Reserve was installed, the value of our dollar in terms of purchasing power is 97% less and falling, continuing to fall. And they want more inflation, which means it's overvalued. When they say they need more inflation, they have a 2% inflation goal on the currency. That's because the currency is overvalued. Its real value is bupkis. It's zero. And Roy Lowry asks... Japan has printed money for 30 years, so why can't the U.S. print for 30 years? That's a great question. I'm so glad that you asked that, Roy. And here it is. If this is why this is so critical for you guys to share this information, because if everybody accepts it, they can. They can. They'll go into negative rates because the value, the purchasing power value is already gone. That's what negative rates are about. There's no more of that left. So now they have to attack principal. But I don't know. Can they take 30 years to eat up the rest of your principal? You have to look for compounding for that. So can they? Well... You know, honestly, I suppose they can as long as it's okay with the all the households and the public. That's why that loss of confidence is so critical. That's why that perception management is so critical and why the Bank of Japan is quaking in their boots because the public, their households, do not believe them when they say, we're going to hit 2% inflation. They're not credible. So it is about public confidence. And that's all coming to a head right now. We're not starting from a high place. We're starting from a low place. I haven't checked this in a while, but I did uh, one of the videos that I did a while ago was about that public confidence. And at that time, if I recall this correctly, uh, the according to Pew, only 6% of the U.S. public had confidence in Congress. And I think it was 20 it was, it was somewhere around that for individual banks, but somehow it was like 22% or something like that still had confidence in the markets. Well, you get bloodied and, bre and, and beaten up and bruised enough, you think these markets can go up forever? Maybe. I don't think so. But we are in the twilight zone, so... Um, so why can't Japan devalue the yen to get out of the long slump? Well, that's exactly what's been happening. They have been devaluing it. And the dollar has been getting a lot stronger. But because the Bank of Japan has held interest rates at, at or below zero for so long that, quite honestly, I mean, that alone has devalued the currency and it still didn't pull them out of the slump because it distorts the normal process of the economy and the normal intermediation of the banks, which is to take in savings and then to distribute that savings in a viable, growable way into the economy. You remember, we've talked about this, so I'm just going to remind you that there are two types of debt. There is a self-liquidating debt, and non-self-liquidating debt, okay? Self-liquidating debt would be like, okay, you have this great idea for a business or to expand your business, so you go to the bank and you borrow some money from the bank that somebody has deposited in there 
and you expand your operations, you maybe you buy another uh, piece of real estate, more equipment, you hire more people. So that is economically stimulating, but you generate more business from that and that pays off that debt. That's self-liquidating debt and that is a good thing. But because interest rates have been held at zero for so long, what we've had, and I just did a piece on this and we'll put the attachment in there, but I'm, I'm gonna go into this more deeply in a, in a near future uh, video as well. What's been happening, and Japan was really the one that introduced this, is the rise of the zombie corporations which because their cost to carry has dropped so low, they've taken on debt, even though their earnings don't keep pace with their costs, they've simply taken on more and more and more debt to supplement their declining earnings. We've seen that in a lot of corporations and heck, look at all the unicorns. They, they don't have even a plan of becoming profitable and yet they're worth billions and billions of dollars. That is a misallocation of funds and that distorts real capitalism by using up the resources, these zombie firms that are not making money. And, and in order to be a zombie, you have to uh, not make money for three years. Your income can't, can't keep pace with your cost. And it looks like that's just not gonna happen. So these are not, no longer are they viable corporations. And yet the policies have kept them alive. And I mean, that's what we're dealing with here in the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, we could put that link in, Meg, if you, if you make a note, I'll give you that link on the report that I used that they just did on the rise of zombie banks. Thank you, Japan. So no, this, this can't go on. It can go on longer as long as public confidence is there, as long as we believe in the credibility of the central banks, then it can go on for a little bit longer. Can it go on for another 30 years? I don't think so. No, I don't see it. I don't see it. Look at, look at the results. Profitability, deterioration, and stability concerns, increasing risks, weakening functions of financial intermediaries, negative impact on life insurance and pensions. Can that go on for another 30 years? I don't think so. I don't think so. We're already seeing the cracks. None of this is working. It's not like that worked. It didn't work. None of it worked. I'm going to show you this one more time. And I would really um, encourage you to go ahead and pull this image because you have access to all these images too. And this graph in particular, which goes back to the 90s, ZERP, ZERP with QE, just more QE and ZERP, negative rates, QQE on steroids, QE on steroids, and YCC, it, do, it does not work. Does not. If you have any questions that come up for you after this about this, I mean, this is so important that we get this is because we're going to be experiencing the same thing. And if you don't know what's happening, you can't get into the proper position to thrive through this. And that's what we specialize in, creating those strategies based on you. you. If you do our strategy, you're actually doing the same strategy that I designed for myself based upon these repeatable patterns, but tweaked for your particular circumstances. And let me tell you, we're running out of time. No, I don't think they can, 30 years? I don't know for sure that they can do it for another 30 days. The system is breaking down. I don't care how many times they tell you how awesome it is. If it was so awesome, why would they have to keep doing these things? You saw what happened when they tried to take it away. You saw that. Boy, did they turn course. The economy is not doing great. It's not. I don't care what they say. My father, do what I say and not what I do. I'm looking at what you're doing and that tells me the truth that the economy, the global economy is breaking down. It's breaking down and no amounts of nerds or zerps or any of these 
fancy things or these other MMT, none of this is going to stop that because everything other than gold and silver are ridiculously overvalued. That has to be burned out. The debt levels are not payable, period. That has to be burned out. And the current system doesn't work. Doesn't work. How much more proof do you need? Do you really have to have the whole thing come down on your head in order to say, oh, this isn't working? They're showing you that it's not working. They're telling you that it's not working, even though they turn around and say, yeah, all of this is not working, but hey, success. Come on, seriously, come on. Financial shields are made of physical gold and physical silver. And even a little bit of that fiat cash, a little bit. Definitely. It is not made up of, we promise we're going to do this and this is going to work. We're going to tax you to death. We're not going to tax corporations to death, but we're going to tax you to death. We're going to give away all sorts of tax benefits to these large corporations that are moving into our neighborhood because they're going to hire you at a little bit more than minimum wage. Isn't that good for you? Don't you want to be part of the service sector? Let's share. I'll own everything, but I'll share it with you and you'll pay me. Sounds like a deal. Don't you want to be the owner? I want my kids to be the owner. I want my grandkids to be the owner because then they're going to have options and they're going to have a whole lot better life. Don't you want the same thing for yourself and your family? So tomorrow I'm going to talk about interbank lending and more grease for the financial wheels. And then next week I'm going to talk more about Sweden because I want to take some time to do a deep dive in it and I don't really have it. But interbank lending and what's going on with LIBOR, we need to stay on top of that anyway. So that's tomorrow. And then we've got some technicals coming up in June with Greg Manorino. And get your questions. If you have any questions that you want me specifically to, yeah, ask Greg or even ask Rob Embers on cybersecurity, send them into Megan or send them into questions but earmark it. Which way would it be better, Meg? Questions at ipmtrading.com and then put in the subject questions for Greg Manorino, questions on cybersecurity, list a topic in the subject. Okay, so if you send it into questions, but you specifically say, you know, put in there for Greg Manorino or Rob, we've got enough time to gather your questions. So whatever comes up for you, let you know, because frankly, we're all here to be of service. And I'm definitely here to do these deep dives. And, and I hope that this new format helps you understand this material better, because it's critical that you do. So... Until tomorrow, you know, if you like this, give us a thumbs up. Make sure that you share, share, share. This would be a big sharer. Please, you're going to do your friends and your family a favor. You can't determine whether or not they look at it, but they can, you can determine whether or not you send it to them and you suggest they do. I'm not saying cram it down their throats because, hey, you know, happy wife, happy life kind of thing. But... Do yourself a favor, do them a favor, do them a service, and at least put this information in front of them so that they get to make educated choices. And until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.